Uh, good afternoon, Raymond. Uh, I'm sorry not being able to be with you today to exchange of ideas and to learn from each other's experience. I'm hoping that in the future there will be another occasion to do that. I'm also sorry about my cold and my voice. I, I'm, I know I'm sounding strangely. I'm very pleased that uh, this year's event focused the right to food. It's in the heart of my mandate, and it is very timely and necessary to adopt the right face approach to food policies in the US, law schools, and environment. Even though economic and social rights and the right to food is a familiar concept in American human rights literature since the 1950s, and the indivisibility of the human rights is the norm since 1990s, for several reasons, Economic and social rights have been left behind in the US and many developed countries claiming that they can deal with such issues at a policy level do not need accountability, indiscrimination, and entitlement procedures. And the provide had adequate culturally acceptable food for all, for everyone, and all the time. Obviously, this is not true. As today, according to FAO, most recent findings we have 795 million people globally are hungry chronically, and billions who are uh, food insecure. We all now realize that hunger is not about food shortages, but many about economic conditions. The vast majority of this hungry and food insecure people live in developing countries, despite the fact that those parts of the world are clearly aware of the right to food concept. It is relevant to note that more than 130 countries ratified the covenant of the economic, social, and cultural rights, which includes a legal uh, affirmation of the right to food in Article 11. This provision confirms that the right to food is a universal, fundamental human rights and is now embedded in authoritative customary international law principles. Following the covenant, a significant number of countries have internalized the right to food by way of constitutional principles, framework laws, and otherwise to respect, protect, and fulfill their responsibility to practice what was agreed on. Moreover, in many parts of the world, from India to Kenya, from Guatemala to Brazil, court systems have supported the right to food concept in their decisions. Yet, in many countries, right to food concept were accepted rhetorically, but not being implemented vigorously. I'm not going to talk today about all these legal developments in domestic and international level, which is extremely important, but I will give you an example of what I have been experiencing since I became the UN Special Rapporteur on Food for the Human Rights Council in Geneva. This will give you some ideas of uh, what is wrong with our food systems globally, what kind of problems we have, and how to overcome them. Of course, uh, the last part of the challenge is very ambitious task, so much so that many people are saying we need a paradigm shift. How will this happen? Hopefully, it will happen when first we have a clear understanding of the problems, and then mobilize popular support from bottom to top with an agenda for major change. I'm going to talk today about the relationship between climate change and food systems which are affecting our lives in a fundamental manner. It's a very complex phenomenon as food systems are acutely vulnerable to climate change. And are at the same time responsible for rising greenhouse gas emissions. As you are well aware, this year is extremely important for climate change diplomacy. The entire world community is waiting to see what will happen in Paris. The outcome uh, there will shape the immediate future and let us know whether we are on the right track to achieve change or whether business as usual will prevail with likely disastrous consequences. Needless to say, food systems are already significantly impacted by the adverse impact of the climate change, although this impact is 
varies with regions and depends on specific geographical and economical conditions. The most vulnerable geographies in the world are already experiencing serious problems due to extreme weather events, floods, heat waves, and droughts. People that are living in most of these places are already poor and are not contributing significant emissions responsible for global warming. Any adequate solution to climate change challenges must be undertaken with sensitivity to its justice and equity-oriented uh, dimensions. This means, first and foremost, that we need a humanized approach to any solution, and I have been working with many others to be sure that a humanized approach is prominently included in the upcoming climate change negotiations. The UN Human Rights Council issued several resolutions over the course of the last few years to inform the international community about how to address climate injustices in light of the impact of climate change on various human rights. This is currently an uphill road and very difficult. From the perspective of right to food, we are talking about the need to protect 500 million small-scale subsistence farmers that are already food insecure, many of them. It is rarely appreciated that almost 70% of our food production comes from these farmers, especially in developing countries. These people not only are suffering from extreme weather events, flood, drought, and decreased yields, but they are also suffering from mitigation policies of the Climate Change Convention. Their lands are increasingly occupied by transnational corporations or by sovereign states of the developed world seeking to produce biofuel and other crops as alternative green technology and thereby reduces greenhouse gas emissions. This means the developed world uses more clean fuel for transportation at the expense of poor people's food, it has to appearance of a Faustian bargain. Moreover, clean development mechanism of the Climate Change Convention displaced indigenous peoples from their land by implementing further policies such as Red Plus and other mechanisms so that the developed world will deliver uh, its promises but the poor will pay the real cost of such policies by losing their land, food, and livelihood. These issues can only be properly addressed if we implement a human rights approach to climate change policies. This is not apparent at first glance. I'm not even going to talk about the way in which extractive industries are damaging the livelihood of poor peoples throughout Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, which is itself an important aspect of this topic. It's important to realize that global policymakers, technology believers, and market-based solution promoters each make their own solutions. They typically start their argument by first indicating that we will have 9 million people in 2050 and due to climate change impact, we need a 50% increase in food production. This means we need more chemicals, more biotech solutions, more reliance on agribusinesses. They favor new green revolution, solution under the language of climate smart agriculture. If we do not examine these policies more carefully to look behind the rhetoric of their language, and if we do not pay attention to the economic and social impacts of such policies on poor subsistence smallholder farmers and the least fortunate, we will trap ourselves. It will generate another problematic food policy as happened during the first green revolution that took place in such a developing countries as Mexico, India, and Philippines. Supply-oriented food policies are unfortunately prevalent one among mainstream food policy makers. The consequences of this policy will bring us more environmental catastrophes 
as we will be de depleting valuable and scarce natural resources, including water, soil, biological diversity, and create ecosystem imbalances while we are stocking ourselves with unhealthy foods that could produce dangerous and widespread health hazards. So, aside from failing to solve the problem, the mainstream solutions that are now being offered will only deepen present difficulties. We will be creating conditions leading to unhealthy future generations. We will be more depending on bioengineered food. We will continue to lose smallholder farmers and we will damage our food culture if we do not see what will happen to us in the future if we persist in doing what we have been doing. This is what I have been experiencing in the first year of my mandate as a special rapporteur, witnessing food policies that are going to wrong directions as a result of globalizing the way in which we are eating every season all food that is available to us instead of relying on what is being produced totally, locally and seasonally. The good news is that the food sovereignty movement is growing. It is growing in the US and in the other developed world. Everywhere citizens are awakening, local food movements, agroecology are emerging and making their way fell in mainstream dis discussions although not yet able to challenge status quo practices. What I am trying to do in my UN role is to try and stop developing countries from imitating the wrong agricultural examples of the West, as they unfortunately did in many other areas, such as environmental pollution and dirty industrialization, and not to become trapped by industrial agriculture and lose their valuable underdeveloped resources in the name of economic development and a related effort to reach global markets. Thanks for listening.